Good morning, beloved. We have an exciting topic today, and I hope the same excitement that happened in the early church will still be with us as we take up this very important topic. And you already know, perhaps from the way we've titled it, that it's something that we need to do better at. And that's the forgotten enabler, the Holy Spirit. We welcome you to the second part of our five-part series on Church Reset. Uh, and again, to remind you, in case you were not here last week, what, what does it mean to reset? It's not to reboot, it's not to restart, because when you reset a computer, you actually wipe out everything there and go back to what it was supposed to be from the beginning. And we're taking cues now, collectively as a church and individually as believers, from the book of Acts. How do we live as a church family? How do we live as individuals based on the truths of God as revealed in the book of Acts? Last week, we looked at joining God's kingdom agenda. We were saying God's purpose for a believer, and a very key one, among many other reasons why we are still here, is that we could join him in his agenda. And I hope we were all agreed with that, because that was so clear from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But now, moving forward, and again moving forward in the book of Acts, we see something else. And we're looking at the event called Pentecost. So... My role this morning, friends, is to make us look together at the key character in that event called Pentecost, and we will look at the entire book of Acts together as we look at Pentecost, and it will just be the jump-off point. So I'll be very transparent with you. We are, in a sense, just using the passage now, not going through it in detail. It will serve as a jump-off point because we'll look at the theme, the theme of the Holy Spirit rather than the passage per se. So let me ask you these questions. You already know the answer to. Who is the most overlooked member of the Holy Trinity? Who is the most probable cause of death of many churches today? Why are many churches stagnant or dying, not vibrant? I mean, they could be so sound, so solid, and yet dying. And why are so many Christians who know their salvation? They know they're saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, and therefore by grace alone. And yet, you look at them, they're aimless, they're purposeless, and their lives do not seem to have any power. And, you know, if somebody said, will you show me a Christian so I would like to be one, one of you, and you will not point to this person. Because they don't seem to have God's power in them. Why are these things happening? Dying churches, an overlooked member of the Trinity, and powerless Christians. The answers are the same. The neglect of the Holy Spirit. The neglect of the Holy Spirit, friends, is an ongoing tragedy, and we must make sure we don't go the same way, whether as a family of believers called GCF, including you beloved people online. You're part of this family now, and, uh, or as individual Christians. So let me just take some statements about the Holy Spirit before we continue. And I need to warn you ahead of time, we'll be sometimes... Sounding technical. That's not my purpose. We're not here to, to fill your mind with info, but some of them we'll have to explain in detail. So I'm giving you an advance warning. Sometimes we'll sound technical. So who is the Holy Spirit? To answer an obvious question, but it's important to answer this right. The Holy Spirit, friends, is the member of the Trinity, whom the Bible most often represents as being present to do God's work today. He is the one who is with us. Why? Remember the ascension? Remember Acts 1.8? Those were the very last words of Jesus before he literally ascended. He departed from the 11 apostles. And so when he ascended, what did he say? You will receive power. What did he say previously in John 14 to 16? The Father will send you, after I'm gone, another comforter, another parakletos. The Holy Spirit, he promised this, and that's what he did. He fulfilled that promise. So God the Father is ruling over all the universe, sitting on his throne. Yes, he still is. Sometimes we don't feel that way, we forget that way, because sometimes men seem so powerful and dominant, or our problems too big, but God the Father is still on his throne. Seated on his right hand. The seat of authority, the seat of authority is Jesus Christ, co-regent with God. So who is here on earth representing God? Who is here doing what Jesus said, I will build my church? Guess who? You know who it is. It's the Holy Spirit, friends. 
So whenever you hear statements about the work of God on earth, it's the Holy Spirit who is doing this. So the Holy Spirit, friends, is the one most prominently present with us now. And so may I take what uh, Wayne Grudem said in his uh, systematic theology and give, share this to you. He said, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to manifest the active presence of God in the world and especially in the church. So collectively, the church, individually, me and you. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So again, God the Father is in his kingdom in heaven overruling all of us, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, and beside him. At the right hand of power is the Lord Jesus Christ, and they send the Holy Spirit after the ascension of Christ to do God's work on earth. So friends, the Holy Spirit is working in us and among us and through us in this church and in you. I hope we're clear on that. So here's the question. Why has modern Christianity neglected the Holy Spirit? There are at least two reasons I will share with you here. One or both are true. I think most of the time both. First is we rely too much on ourselves, whether as a church or whether as individuals. Uh, what happened, Pastor? We, we have been infected with another virus, uh, not COVID. It's the viral spirit of this selfie generation, the self-obsessed generation. And it has in- entered even... The way we lead churches, when I say churches, I mean churches in general worldwide. You know, uh, you could make it into a statement which is a takeoff on what Paul said. Instead of saying, Lord, I believe with all my heart that your grace is sufficient for me. Many churches and sometimes individuals really say in their hearts, my blank is sufficient for me. Fill in the blanks. What do we substitute for the Holy Spirit? A church could substitute my reputation. You know, my, my Philippine-wide and global reputation as Green as Christian Fellowship is sufficient for us. God forbid. As an individual, my brilliance, my talent, my eloquence, my network, my assets in the bank, my network of friends, my clan is sufficient for me. We may not see it like that, but we actually live it out like that. That's one reason, self-sufficiency. The other one is, and I'm getting real here, friends. Uh, You know, I don't want to give you a theoretical message. We are afraid. We're being honest with ourselves. We're afraid of being lumped together with our Pentecostal brethren. Because sometimes they do have excesses. And you know what we did? In our desire not to be lumped with them, we sometimes go to the other extreme. And what is that? Insensitivity or sometimes, God forbid, upright unbelief in the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's not stated like that, you know, I do not believe, but, you know, unbelief in the way we live. We we simply are not sensitive to him, at the very least. We're not following his lead And I'll go there in a while, but sometimes it goes to the other extreme. We simply do not believe in his power because we're afraid of being classified with our charismatic and Pentecostal brothers. If we'll be humble enough, and I know this might cause some reaction in some of you, we actually have some things to learn from them. If we'll be humble enough. What we'll do today is we'll use the birth of the church at Pentecost to examine the biblical teaching about our forgotten enabler, the Holy Spirit. So the book of Acts will be for illustration and the epistles and the words of Jesus for explanation. First, what is the significance of the Holy Spirit to the church? First, the Holy Spirit friend shows his power and presence usually through proclamation. The Holy Spirit is not a silent entity because God is not a silent entity, friends. Uh, In fact, the way that the Holy Spirit works today is usually, not exclusively, but usually through proclamation. That's forth telling, telling forth. No longer needing as much foretelling, telling the future. Why? Because the future is here. It's found in the book of Revelation, 1 Thessalonians, in the words of Jesus and other prophecies in the Bible. The future is already here. We don't need 
tellers, telling us what will happen in the future. That's why I hope you never one of those people, you remember those people years ago who were saying, at such and such a date, Jesus will arrive. You know how many times that happened in the last 20 years? Six times. Can you imagine that? And all six times, all those 20 years in 2000, they were all wrong. I hope you were not one of those who believed in them because some people did. They sold everything and they waited and nothing happened and many people got their goods very cheap. So no more foretelling, but telling forth or foretelling. Look at Acts 2 verse 4. It says, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, anticipating a question, and I'll not dwell on it, but I'll answer it. Why do we not speak in tongues anymore? Well, because it's found in your Bibles, in verse 8. Look at what it says there in uh, verse 8 and 9 and all the way to 11. It says there, especially in verse 11, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Do you know how important that is? That is the very definition for an acceptable speaking in tongues, which is not happening today. It's not happening today. People have to be understanding. And not only are they understanding, the content must be, verse 11, the mighty works of God. So they must be understandable, and they must be about the mighty works of God. Paul affirms that in 1 Corinthians when he said, if you speak, and there's no interpreter, you shut up. We're not observing that today, and that's the reason why we're not doing that anymore. Why did they happen then, Pastor? It's part of our doctrinal statement, by the way. Why has it stopped? Because, friends, when the Bible was being written, people had to confirm the authenticity, the veracity, the credibility of the writers, which were the apostles. So there was a limited time in history when these charismata, you know, the special sign gifts were needed. But with the completion of the book of the Bible, particularly with the last one called the book of Revelation, written at the end of John's life, we don't need those things anymore because we have the complete 66 books of the Word of God. And they're enough, more than enough for us to study together and learn the will of God. So, Pastor, what does it mean then when you say that the Holy Spirit shows His power and presence through proclamation? You find that described further in Acts 4.8. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. And the story here is they were arrested for healing somebody and preaching about the resurrection. So they were arrested by the religious leaders just like their master was. And uh, this is Peter. You know, I, I want to dwell a little on Acts 4.8. You, you see, you must remember who Peter was. Remember Peter? The loud mouth. Uh, before he was, you know, before he saw Jesus rise from the dead, he was the one who was always talking. And then when Jesus needed him most, remember what happened? He abandoned Jesus and denied he ever knew him. And then what happened? When Jesus rose from the dead, he realized who Jesus really was. God the Son. And when he realized who Jesus was, he was never the same. He was never the same. This former coward friend is the one speaking in Acts 4.8. This is a changed man. So it's not a small thing. That's why I use this as an illustration. This is a changed man addressing Perhaps the very same people who crucified his master in Acts 4.8. And in Acts 4.31, this is now talking about the apostles. When they had prayed, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. What does it mean? The Holy Spirit comes. And there is proclamation. But it's not just proclamation. The Holy Spirit is not just silent. But he speaks the words of God. And they don't just speak. They speak with boldness. And you know as an individual now, as an individual believer of this family called GCA, that God's Spirit is with you when you have this boldness. When you're not ashamed of the one who's not ashamed to die for you, friend, the Holy Spirit is working inside you, and all we need to do is not suppress Him, not fight Him, not wrestle with Him. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. You better talk to that person. And what do we do? Lord, I'd rather wrestle with you. I'd rather have a mixed martial arts match with you 
wrestle with you, then speak to that person. That's what we do. It's called quenching the Spirit. These people did not. Acts 4.31, the Holy Spirit was with them, and it resulted in proclamation with boldness. That is one of the significance of the Holy Spirit to the church. The church friends needs proclamation. The ministry of Jesus Christ needs proclamation. And it's not just this pulpit, friends. That's the source of proclamation. It's you and I as individuals. This pulpit can only do so much. But your proclamation in your individual lives is what actually grows the church. There are very, very few churches that grow because of the pulpit, friends. The pulpit is just part of God's ministry. The churches grow because the individuals proclaim. They're not silent because God is not silent. God's spirit is not silent. And you know the spirit is in you. You know the spirit is talking to you when there is something that tells you, you go out there and be unafraid. You go out there and be unashamed. And we know that, friends, as part of the ministry and significance of the Holy Spirit. Number two. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God never work independently of each other. Where the Word is proclaimed, the Holy Spirit is there in power. Look at Acts 10.44. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the Word. Who is this? Cornelius and his family. Cornelius, as you know, was somebody who was very interested in the things of God, but he was not yet a believer. He was a seeker for God. And God told Peter in a dream, Peter, go out there and reach out to this family. I'll not go through the details of the dream because to prolong the message. But basically, Peter got it. I have to go to the Gentiles because the good news isn't just for Jews. And so that's what happened. As, as, as he was sharing the gospel to them in Acts 10, 44, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word when they became believers. And 1 Thessalonians 1.5 confirms that. When Paul said to the Thessalonians, our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Friends, the Holy Spirit and the word never contradict each other. So I want to balance what I told you in the first significance with this one. Yes, the Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts. As a church, That's why we have a council of elders that includes pastors there. Because pastors and elders are the same entity anyway. But individually especially, composing the church, the Holy Spirit speaks to us. But always, always using this. You will never get anything from the Holy Spirit that contradicts the word of God. And when it comes from the Holy Spirit and it agrees with the word of God... It will come with power, friends. And you could be confident. You could be God-confident. You can live your whole life with God-confidence when you've exposed yourself repeatedly and soak your heart and mind with the Word of God. And when God now uses the Word to speak to you, you could be confident. This is the Holy Spirit, and I will be bold. But if something, for example, is the opposite, You know, the Holy Spirit will say to you something that you know is directly against one of the very clear commandments of God. Will you still debate in your heart, could this be from God? You know, the Holy Spirit, you get a prompting, for example, that I need to try out this church that promises special powers to those who do certain things. I want you to know at at the very start, this is not of the word of God. All the power you need was given to you on salvation. Don't you believe anyone or anything, any person on TV or on YouTube who says you get special powers and more power if you do certain things, especially giving to my ministry. You know what I'm talking about. So you know, but you say, I seem to have a prompting to go there or support this or send money there. And you listen to the word of God. You you read Ephesians chapter one, which says everything that, that gave Christ the power to raise from the dead is now in you. Are you still going to listen to, to, to words like that? You know, that's not true. So that's what we're saying here. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God never work independently of each other. And where they work together as they should, the Holy Spirit is there in power. There are actually a lot more verses under this. But again, in the interest of time, I'm just citing illustrations from Acts. Because we don't have 
unlimited time. Number three, and this is the last one for now about the significance of the Spirit in the church. The Holy Spirit is the great enabler of church multiplication. Look at Acts 9.31. And this is referring to the early church, friends. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Does that sound familiar? Does it sound familiar? Acts 1.8. This is Jesus fulfilling his promise. And guess who? Guess who made Jesus fulfill his promise? It was the Holy Spirit working to those 11 who caught on fire, and together with the 120 who were the first chapter members of the early church, and then the 3,000 that you read about in Acts chapter 2, this 11 plus 120 plus the 3,000, they worked together, they evangelized corporately and individually, and now you reach Acts 9.31. The church multiplied. And look at what it says. It had peace. It was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And it what? What happened? When it had these things, it multiplied. Isn't that what we all want as a church? I mean, you don't want to be part of a stagnating church, don't you? I mean, why should you be part of a dying church? Well, unless you have this strong mission. I want to revive or help the church, but the normal Christian wants to be part of a lively, vibrant, passionate, on-fire church, obedient to the Word of God and to the God of the Word. Correct? Amen? Thank you for being alive today. That's exactly what we want to be. So it was a multiplying church, and how and why? Because it was walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to be clear about the word comfort there. The word there in Greek is parakletos. Parakletos. Does it sound familiar? Because that's the same word Jesus used in John 14, 16. He said in John 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. So the ESV we're using used the word comfort here, but you could actually substitute that and in the help of the Holy Spirit, and you'll be right because it captures both. It's not one or the other, it's both. In the comfort and help of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. You want GCF to grow? I mean spiritually primarily and secondarily quantitatively. You want it to grow? You want it to grow by planting new churches? aside from growing here spiritually and quantitatively. How? Through the Holy Spirit, through His comfort and help. And I will quote at this point the Bible scholar A.T. Pearson. Here's what he said. It is not already too evident that the church of our day has little or no conception of the pricelessness of blessing involved in this parakletos of the Holy Spirit, the help of the Holy Spirit. What if once more this lesson could be learned? What holy walking in the fear of the Lord, what rapid multiplication, and what worldwide evangelization? There isn't an evil cursing or threatening our church life which discomfort of the Holy Spirit would not remedy and perhaps remove, end of quote. What is he saying? Have we forgotten how essential the Holy Spirit is? Have we, have we become so self-sufficient? Have we become insensitive at the very least and at the very worst, unbelieving? Because we're too afraid to be classified with some of our sincere brothers. I hope not. I pray not, friends. Acts 17, 6 reminds us what was the effect of the early church. Listen to this verse, Acts 17, 6. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here. Who? The apostles and the early Christians. Isn't that something we'd all want to be known? People who turned the world upside down. And how did they do that? They did that to the Holy Spirit. They did not forget their enabler. They were walking in his help and in his comfort. And Zechariah 4.6 is something that you perhaps know by heart. Zechariah 4.6, here is the God the Father speaking in the Old Testament, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God the Father is on his throne. 
Jesus is sitting beside him in the seat of power. The Holy Spirit is now in your heart. The Holy Spirit is in our assembly today. When the church is gathered, God is specially there. And friends, it is the Holy Spirit who enables us to be a church. It is the Holy Spirit who preserved us through the lockdown. It is the Holy Spirit who makes this church grow, not stagnate because of the lockdown. And praise God, we're seeing some of that now. Because when we used to have a parking problem, God said, okay, I'll solve your parking problem, GCF. I'll give you a lockdown. So you can now reach more than just the 3,000 people you have on Sunday. And by God's grace, we've tripled in the people watching our services through online viewership. This is the work of God. This is not us. This cannot be the work of man. We must give glory to God, but that is the work of God. And friends, let this serve as an encouragement, but also as a warning. We better not forget our enabler as a church, because the day self-sufficiency creeps in, the day insensitivity, because we're afraid of being classified with certain groups of sincere believers, the day unbelief itself creeps in and we neglect the Holy Spirit, that's the day this church dies. So let's be inspired by the work of God. Despite this lockdown, we've increased. But let's be warned that if we're not careful, we could quench the spirit and lose whatever power God has granted to us to serve him. In view of that, friends, I'd like to use this opportunity again for you to see this. Could you please flash this on screen? This is still the big picture part two. So what you see here is what we would like to be as a church. What you see at the very bottom is how we will use the church operations, good stewardship of resources, because we do have quite a good blessing from the Lord despite the lockdown, and the ministry structure and culture. These are all just a means to an end. And what is that? To build up the church flock. You see the, the middle? You see how the arrows point up? That's the point there. We will use all these things to, as a means to an end. And what is that? Build up the church flock, but is it building us up so that we become even more well-known? No. We shepherd the flock to grow. Pasture is corporate gatherings. Sunday worship primarily, Wednesday we have these gatherings, we have online worship with Pastor BJ Monday and Friday, we have Wednesday midweek worship, all of these are 8 p.m., you can join us. We have family hour of prayer, 8 to 9 every Thursday. So these, the smaller gatherings, especially the growth group, are the pens. So pasture, the big gathering, pens, the growth groups, and smaller gatherings to grow the church flock spiritually. Why? For another end, that's kingdom impact, and we've talked about that at length last week, but to summarize, is to contribute to God's kingdom agenda, to join Jesus in his exciting mission, to live lives that are purposeful, meaningful, laser sharp and focused, not aimless, not wondering, what, what am I going to do with my life? We join God's agenda, remember? And that's the reason why we need the Holy Spirit let us fear sin, but specifically, let us fear self-sufficiency. Let us fear insensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Let us fear unbelief of the Holy Spirit. And we'll end with this final point, friends. We know what it means for us as a church family. Now, what does it mean for us as Christians? Let's talk about the significance of the Holy Spirit now to you and me as a Christian. First, again, using our passage today, the Holy Spirit was given to you upon salvation. That's Peter's message in Acts 2.38. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, I will anticipate a question, and I'll use this as an opportunity. Pastor, why does it seem that in the book of Acts, they had to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they were living in a time of transition. They were living in a time of transition. Whether it was AD 30 or AD 33, we don't know the exact date. One of these two is correct. When the Pentecost happened, 
for the first 15 to 20 years, it was a time of transition because many of the people there, especially the apostles, friends, the, the early church, they were recipients of the old covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit. Are you following me? The Holy Spirit had a ministry under the old covenant, uh, which was happening during the time of Christ, especially the eleven. But when Jesus said, you wait, Acts chapter 1 verse 5, the Holy Spirit will come with power, Acts 1 8. It happened here in Acts chapter 2. They waited. It happened. And when it happened, they received the new covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit. So because of this transition, are you still following me? It's a transition. There was by necessity a second baptism of the Holy Spirit. But when you now go into the book of 1 Corinthians, which was written around AD 54, about 20 or so years after the Pentecost, look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Paul said, you were in one spirit baptized into one body. It seems to be that 20 years or even less after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came immediately upon salvation, and it, ha it has been so ever since. You follow me? So upon receiving Christ, you're listening to me online, I hope you're following me, the moment that you said to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, I am a sinner. There is no way I could ever deserve your forgiveness. Not by my good works, not by this church I belong to, not by any mediator, but Lord Jesus, I am a bankrupt Help the sinner, will you have mercy on me and save me by what you did on the cross, taking my place? When you say words to that effect, showing repentance toward God and faith in Christ, when you become a Christian, right that instant, the Holy Spirit regenerates you, indwells you, baptizes you, and seals you. I don't want you to be confused by that, but just to say this. You are saved and kept forever once you receive the Lord Jesus Christ and you're sealed forever by the Holy Spirit. One time. No more second baptism. That's what I'm trying to say. Right after salvation, do you have the Holy Spirit within you forever. Continuing. The source of Jesus' power and words, and therefore your power and words, is the Holy Spirit. John 3.34 tells us what kind of experience Jesus had with regards to the Holy Spirit. For he, Jesus, whom God has sent, utters the words of God. For he, God the Father, gives the Spirit without measure, implying this. Friends, review. When did the Holy Spirit come upon Jesus Christ? When? Remember when it happened when he was baptized in Jordan by John the Baptist. Remember that? Remember what John the Baptist was saying before that? Lord, are, are, are you sure you want me to baptize? I'm not even worthy to touch your footwear. That's how unworthy. Why? Because the greatest of all the prophets in the Old Covenant, John the Baptist, knew who he was. God the Son, second person of the Godhead. So he was saying that sincerely. He was not flattering Jesus. But Jesus said, no, no, let it be. It has to be done. So he baptizes Jesus, remember? What happens after Jesus showing us the example of a baptism arises from the immersion? And by the way, baptizo is immersion. Not to justify we're being baptized, okay? The Holy Spirit descends upon him. What? And then, remember? What does God the Father say? This is my beloved son. What is God the Father teaching us? The Trinity. One God, three persons. Now, please do not come to me and say, will you explain all the Trinity, Pastor? Friends, I have five books of theology in my library upstairs. I can lend them to you. They do a terrific job of explaining the Trinity up to a limited extent. Wayne Grudem, uh, Erickson, Moody's Handbook of Theology, Norman Geisler, John MacArthur, uh, and more. I have those five books of systematic theology. They do a good job. But none of them does a perfect job of explaining the Trinity. You know why? Because he is God and we're man. 
We can understand that Trinity up to a certain point, but one God in three persons, Jesus had that on his baptism, and since his baptism, friends, he was infused with power by the Holy Spirit, so the source of his power and words, and here's the best part, your power and your words is the same Holy Spirit. Friends, theoretically, if we're walking in step with God's Spirit, whatever Jesus said you could do, you can. We're limited by our unbelief. We're limited by our lack of faith. But friends, this is what it means. And this is again Acts 1.8. You will receive power. We've been through this last week. I will not dwell on this. But it says when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you have that power now. You have the power to be Christ's witness. You have the words to be Christ's witness. John 16, 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. This is Jesus saying, I know what you're going to say in the 21st century. You're going to say, Lord, I will not speak up for you. Why? I don't know what to say. Well, of course, that's true for all of us. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. To speak up for Christ. You don't have to be a pastor or a missionary to speak up for Christ. You can be you. Called to do what God has given you to do. A good engineer, a good doctor, a good teacher, a good student. Whatever God has called you to do. You stay there and do a good job. Show a good testimony. And guess what? God will give you the power and the words. Don't worry, God will guide you into all truth. And the very least you and I should prepare is what? Your personal testimony. Remember that? Does anybody here not have a testimony? Of course not. The reason why you're here is because you have a testimony. You got saved. So what do you do? My life before. My life now. So what happened? What Jesus did for me. Three simple points. A very simple outline. This is who I used to be. By God's grace, this is what I become. You know what happened in between? This is what Jesus did for me. Those are what we're talking about when we talk about John 16, 13. This also applies, by the way, to your quiet times. When the Spirit of truth comes, He'll guide you into all the truth. Number three. The Holy Spirit creates people of power and spiritual character. Did you get this, friends? The Holy Spirit does not make mediocre people. Don't ever consider yourself a mediocre person. God doesn't make junk. You're not supposed to be mediocre. I'm not supposed to be mediocre. And we're talking about spiritual things, friends. Acts 6.3, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom. The first Deacons, they were the prototype of the deacons. That's why they were not called that way. But they had to be full of the Spirit. And when they were full of the Spirit, they had wisdom. Acts 11.24, referring to Barnabas. For he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. When God's Spirit is inside you, you have wisdom, you have faith. And here's the best verse of them all. It summarizes. The virtues, Galatians 5, 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. The ninefold fruit of the Spirit. They are the virtues that make the world look at us. I think it was a couple of nights ago, I was with a, a Zoom conference call with our Lausanne uh, brothers and sisters. You remember Lausanne last year had the Global Workplace Forum here. They had follow-up meeting. They invited me last Friday night. And uh, we had breakout groups. And in one of the breakout groups, the question, I was in the whole life discipleship group. And one of the questions was, how do we make the church attractive to the generations today? Referring to the Gen Z and millennial generation. And there was a very, very wise answer that I took note of. This person said, I have discovered that the Gen Z and millennials, they're not looking for what we do or not do. They're looking for who we are. 
They're looking for a reflection, a positive thing. They're not really listening to our word. They're looking at us. And he said, it goes back to Galatians 5, 22 to 23. When the Gen Z, those born 1995 up, and the millennials born before 1995 look at us and they see love, joy, peace, and they know we're not pretending, they know we're not putting on a show, they will come to our churches. Because that's what the world does not have. And I said, wow, that is something else. This was a young lady speaking, by the way, who is a millennial. It's part of the workplace forum. And I said, that is so wise, horse's mouth. Friends, do we want this church attractive to Gen Z and millennials? It's not what we say. It's not even what we do or not do. They know we are avoiding sin. They know that. But they're looking at us, they're observing us. Do they really have love? Do they have joy? Do they have peace? Do they suffer long or do they lash out in anger? They have goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Do they have these things? If they have that, I want to be there. They, these people are genuine. We don't have to have a, a, an entertaining show every Sunday. You know what Spurgeon said about having a circus? I put that on my Facebook post one time. Spurgeon said, if you have to uh, run a carnival every Sunday, you have to keep giving that every single time. We're not a carnival church. I know there are churches who specialize in carnivals. They will get celebrities, they get big bands, and by the way, we don't have big bands anymore because of the lockdown anyway. But friends, if the Holy Spirit is in us, the Holy Spirit is in you and me as individuals. And the young people see in us love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, self-control. They'll say, I want to be there. I don't care if they don't have the best band in the Philippines. I don't care if they don't have an entertainment show every Sunday. I want to be there because those people are genuine. And those young people flocking to this kind of church, they'll find that out soon enough. That a carnival, an entertaining show, does not grow them spiritually. And I pray by the grace of God, we'll always be the kind of church that pleases God. Last but not least, friends, the Holy Spirit spoke clearly to his servants then. I'll be cautious with this, but not apologetic about this. Why should we think he no longer speaks clearly to us now? Who told us? I don't think it's somebody who told us. It's just our fear of being classified or lumped together with our Pentecostal and charismatic brothers that makes us so afraid of the Holy Spirit. Why are we afraid of the Holy Spirit? He's our enabler. He's our comforter. He's our helper. He is the one whom the Trinity said, you do God's work on earth, okay? And we're now afraid of him. Look at Acts 8.29. The Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. Are you, are you serious, Pastor? Are you saying God could speak specifically to me? Yes. And you realize that when you wrestle with him or when you open up your mind to the fact that most of the time we play wrestling matches with the Holy Spirit. When it's something that's positive and it's something that does not contradict this, you better believe it's the Holy Spirit, friend. You better not wrestle with it. If it's something that aligns with the word of God, it's the Holy Spirit, and he could be specific. Now, I am against, however, may I be clear on this? I'm against people coming to me and say, you know, God told me to tell you, please do not do that to me, okay? So that we remain friends forever. You know why? Because why would God tell you, not tell me? Uh, are you now the fourth member of the Trinity? It's tough being the Trinity. So please, okay? Don't come to another person. God told me to tell you. You better be very sure. But God talking to you like he did to Philip, and may I read for you more because I really want to drive this point home. I will not sleep tonight if I don't drive this point home. Acts 10, 19. While Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, three men are looking for you. Acts 13 to while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Acts 13, you know what this is? 
This is the launching of the missionary movements of Paul. The Holy Spirit said to the early church while they were fasting and praying, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. What happened since then? Has God become deaf? Has God become mute? Or have we become deaf? Friends, he is still doing that today. And lastly, under the same heading, Acts 16, 6 to 7. They, Paul and, and Silas, went to the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. That's Turkey, by the way. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Did you see this? Twice, Paul and his team were not allowed to go to Asia Minor, that's Turkey today, and to Bithynia. Nabitin sila sa Bithynia. The Holy Spirit told them. That's why Paul's power had, ministry had such power. He was listening to the Spirit. The church was listening to the Spirit. The individuals were listening to the Holy Spirit. What happened since then? Has God become mute since then? Or have we become deaf? That's called insensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Friends, I'm talking to myself. It, it, it was primarily out of caution of not going outside our doctrinal standard. I, this, this message is a bit harder than, than usual. But it's also hard for me in the sense because I know some of you might be reacting strongly in your heart. Please do not. That's why I've become very, very, in a sense, bound to the text this time. I'm giving you biblical examples. All my illustrations now are not from, not even my life, not from other sources. It's, it's the book of Acts. So you know, as he spoke, then he speaks now. And God has not stopped speaking, friends. Why should we think he no longer speaks clearly to us now? Let me end with this. What is the way back? How can the church and the Christian regain its neglected power when we stop forgetting our enabler friends? First, we're very clear command in Ephesians 4, 25 to 32, do not grieve the spirit. What does grieve mean? If you look at the context of this passage, it's sin. So what does it mean? If I regard iniquity in my heart, Psalm 66 says, God will not hear me. It interferes with my communication with the Lord. 1 John 1, 9. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful. He is just to forgive us and cleanse us. The communication is restored. The, the parenthood was never broken. God never abandoned us even in the midst of great sin. But the communication was hindered. So do not grieve the Spirit by unconfessed sin. I found out in my life that when I see people very sensitive to sin, you know the Spirit's power is with them. And you know Christians who take sin very trivially, you, you can see it in their lives. You know they're on a path headed to destruction. But a person who's very sensitive to sin, oh Lord, I thought this bad thought, this, these lustful thoughts, Lord, forgive me. When these people are sensitive, you can see the Spirit it's power in their lives. What else? Do not grieve. Number two, do not quench. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 to 20, friends, is about ministry. When believers pour cold water on the fire of ministry, on the passion of ministry, they quench the spirit. Neither should we hinder others in their ministry for God. In other words, friends, self-sufficiency, insensitivity, and worst of all, unbelief. They quench the spirit. If we keep questioning that God is talking to us, when what he's saying is clearly aligned with this, you go in this direction, then we are quenching the spirit. That's why I love the way that the strategy that you saw was made. That was made by much prayer and consultation. Both are found in the word of God. I'll not go into those verses, but friends, godly counsel and prayer, humility before God, seeking God's face, basing the strategy on devotion based on the book of Acts. All of these were an attempt to seek the heart of God, and God came through. What you saw is what God revealed to the pastors, elders, and deacons, and many church members who were consulted in making that strategic map that you just saw.
I'm not trying to promote that because we came up with that. I'm saying to you, I believe with all my heart, we consulted God's spirit. We bowed before him in humility, and he honored that, friends. It is the work of God. Now, we must be very careful. This is in your outlines. I put that there to emphasize it. We must be very careful not to grieve or offend the Holy Spirit. He will not force himself on us against our wills. Once you are saved, ministry and holiness is synergistic. I'm a firm believer that salvation is monergistic. It's all of God, starting from his divine election. But once you become a Christian, it's synergistic. My, sanct- my, my holiness, godliness, my ministry and service, its effectiveness is by cooperating with God because God has now allowed us to obey him or not to obey him. So that's why it's there. But if we resist and quench and oppose him, his empowering will depart and he will remove the blessing from our lives. Last but not least, this is God's mercy. He doesn't just say do not grieve or do not quench. He tells us instead... Be filled with the Spirit. It's a command. It's continuous. That means I could, I could be talking to you right now, God forbid it's true, and not be filled with the Spirit. It, it, it's something that needs to be constantly done because the word in Greek is in the present imperative mood. It's actually be continuously filled with the Spirit. It means I can actually disobey that. You could actually minister to in church or outside church, and not be filled with the Spirit. So Paul says, be continuously filled with the Spirit. That's why it's commanded. And it's the same thing in Galatians 5.16. Walk by the Spirit and not gratify the desires of the flesh. What is this, Pastor? Is it a mysterious thing? Do we have to have some special revelation? No. God in His mercy doesn't want to make life hard for us. This is taking the Bible. And letting it fill your heart and soul and mind. I like, again, the way way that Spurgeon described it. He said, we should be so filled with the Bible. If somebody pricks us, instead of blood coming out, it should be Bible verses. It is taking the word of God and letting it fill our heart and mind or soul so that the Holy Spirit does not work in a vacuum. Are you following me, friends? If I do not open the word of God, And by the way, the pulpit is supplementary. The most important is your personal time with God. Whatever you call it, quiet time, devotion, reflection, whether it's 5, 10, 15, or 45 minutes, as long as you do it intentionally and regularly, that's how you grow. And when you are so filled with the Word of God, then the Spirit will speak to you. He will not speak in a vacuum, friends. He will not speak if the Bible is not in our hearts. Why? Because he knows where our hearts are very deceptive. Let's say I'm somebody who has this very strong desire about something. And I'm not reading the Bible. And then one day I will have this insight and say, this this, this has to come from the Holy Spirit. You're probably wrong. If you have very strong desires or preferences or purposes, or aspirations, but you're not filled with the Spirit, you know what will happen? You will be deceiving yourself. I will be deceiving myself. I'm supposed to be, as the designated member of the Board of Elders, it has been delegated to me by the Board of Elders to feed you with the Word most of the time. Friends, if I am not exposing myself to this, I cannot give you what I do not have. So friends, If you want to be filled with the Spirit, fill yourself with this. Because God's Spirit will not work in a vacuum. And what happens, Pastor? When we are filled with God's Word, it controls our thinking and action. And we become more and more under the Spirit's control. God will have more of us if we have more of His Word. Can I say that again? You see, that's the bottom line of the whole sermon. If you forget the entire message, the only thing you remember, we're okay. God Spirit will have more of us the more we have of His Word. Fill your hearts and minds with your personal daily time with God. 
Don't let anything interfere with that. Put it a higher priority than your work, your love life, your ministry. Make your relationship with God be dependent on your intake of the Word of God. And friends, the Spirit of God will have more of us the more we have of His Word. And what happens? To be filled with the Spirit is to live in the consciousness of the personal presence of Christ. Do you realize Christ's Spirit is in you? In me? Isn't that awesome? There's nothing bigger than that. There's nothing more awesome than that. God is in me. Me? Yes. By His grace, this results in desiring what God desires, doing what God wants, speaking by God's power, praying and ministering in God's strength. I love what one of our members posted about herself. On Facebook, she said, I'm not self-confident. I'm God-confident. Oh, may it be so for all of us. May you come out of this place today God-confident because you've been having more and more of God's Word so that God's Spirit will have more and more of you. And when you walk in the Spirit, friends, you'll discover what you've been missing. The more you're filled with the Spirit, you realize, why didn't I do this earlier? And I pray that will be an experience for all of us to treasure. Let us pray. Father, we pray that you grant us, Lord, a sensitivity to your spirit. You grant us, Father, the the power to overcome the self-sufficiency that we often resort to, especially because this church, Lord, seems to have something that Maybe others don't have. God forbid we ever rely on those things. And maybe personally, Father, sometimes we look at what we have and think that we can do without your Spirit. Lord, forgive us for those times when we have tried to do things without you and your Spirit. Make us, Father, sensitive to your leading. Fill us with your Word that you might have more of us, Father. And help us, Lord, walk in step with your Spirit. Be filled with Him, and experience the power, the presence we've been missing. And we ask this all for our church. We ask this for ourselves as individuals, and we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.